Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, today Alex the Hebrew Hammer Salkin is back once again on the podcast and Alex and I are talking about a lot of different things today. We're talking about the return of Superman. Really, we're talking about misconceptions of original strength and misconceptions of strength in general. But Alex also reveals the super secret secret within Dan John's Mass Made Simple training program. This is actually the linchpin that holds the whole thing together and makes it work. I think you're going to find this secret very, uh, very interesting. Anyway, guys, super fun conversation with Uncle Alex, as it always is. Lots to learn, lots to share, and lots to laugh about. Thanks so much for listening, and enjoy the show. Pull up a chair and buckle up. It's the Original Strength Podcast. Timmy, old chap. How you doing? Good, man. How are you? I'm doing great. I like the Clark Kent disguise. Well, you know, thought I'd shake it up a bit. Yeah, you know, every once in a while, it's probably nice to go out without being mobbed by fans, you know, it's, wanting Superman's autograph. It's hectic. It, uh, you know, it's, it can be stressful. I can imagine, but you can probably use your x-ray vision to uh, <laughs> see the other side of that stress so it doesn't get you too much. I wish I did have x-ray vision. Get me out of a lot of trouble. Or into a lot of trouble actually i mean i that's true because it depends on how strong it is i watched that superman movie at long last believe it or not like a couple months ago i'd never seen it before uh man of steel ah cavill yeah and um i was like this is really good because i i'm not a huge comic book movies fan with the exception of the dark knight trilogy and um i thought it was really well done it was like as you know, as realistic as you could expect such a storyline to be about, you know, like this alien with these incredible powers, you know, from a different planet or whatever. So I liked it. I liked it very much. Well, he's a he's a great Superman. And they just announced that uh, the Man of Steel 2 will be being made with him as Superman. So it's good that you you like that. Nice. Well, Hank, but wasn't he? He played Superman in a couple of other. DC yeah. Movies, right? That's correct. Uh, the Justice League and Batman versus Superman, whatever it was called. But he didn't have his own a second standalone. Correct. Movie, I see. Okay. Right, right, right. What they really need to get Cavill for is James Bond. I I think he would make a good Bond. I think he would be excellent. I mean, did you ever see The Man from Uncle? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did yeah, we yeah, talk yeah. about this? No, I don't okay. think so. My God. I The first time I saw that movie was I was on a plane. It was, it was kind of a rough patch of my life. I was moving back to the U.S. from Israel. Dirt poor, you know, as you do <laughs> when you live in the Middle East long enough. You just don't have any money. And a um, variety of other things going on. And I was like, you know, this is the first really long flight I've taken in a while. I'm going to settle in for a movie. So I was like, okay, man from Uncle. I like the 60s spy movies. I've seen every James Bond movie. So let's check this out. I think I watched it twice. Like, I never do that. I was like... It ended. I was like, I have to watch this again. I just started again. It was, it was incredible. I it was I seen it a couple times since. I just love it. It's a good movie, and he's good in that movie. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and the point is too, he plays this like spy type of character in the movie. He does a very creditable job of it. So I think, and that's kind of how Daniel Craig got the role as Bond. He played this sort of not spy per se, but he was. Um, Played a character in a movie, uh, Layer Cake. He's a kind of an unnamed character, but he's like the main character in the movie. And it's got intrigue and, you know, suspense and stuff. So the producers saw it and they were like, we got to make this guy James Bond. And, you know, previous to being James Bond, Pierce Brosnan was Remington Steele. Roger was. Moore was the saint, you know? So they had all these, like, we'll say, complementary roles that proved their worth beforehand. I think, I think Cavill should totally be Bond. Well, so he was also a spy in like an uh, evil spy in Mission Impossible 27 or oh, whatever, right, yeah. whatever number I think it was. 85, I think. 85? Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you're right. I forgot about that. He did a good job there, too. Yeah, I think that was, wasn't that where Ethan Hawke, uh, Ethan fights uh, Rocky Balboa? I don't know. I can't remember. I get them all confused. One of those things. Oh, that's where he fought Drago. I Dra think that's okay. where Ethan Drago. Hawke, or Ethan, not Ethan Hawke, it's actually Ethan Hunt. Yeah, I made up. Yeah, Hawke. I was close. I knew it started with H. Close enough, absolutely. So Good how the heck are Hunt. you, man? Oh, man. I've been doing amazing. Things yeah. are going well. I'm like midway through a workout right now. I had a, I did like the first quarter of it before another <laughs> call. And then I got another quarter of it done now. So I'm like halfway done. And then after this call, 
I have to finish the final half of it. And then I got to get ready to go teach. I teach the uh, kids at my synagogue twice a week. So I've got to prepare a lesson plan. And I mean, I've already know what I'm going to teach them. So it's not like, you know, I'm no dereliction of duty. The kids are learning a lot for sure, but uh, I've got to, I got to look nice as I do it. And so right now I'm still somewhat moist from my workout. If we could, <laughs> that's the closest thing I'm going to say to a swear word on this podcast is the word moist. <laughs> The take home lesson is that this podcast is going to be so hot. You paused in the middle of a workout <laughs> to Even, do the I've podcast. Got, and I've got the creative juices flowing. I got a lot to say, Tim. None of it is going to be swear word laden other than that word moist. Uh, moist. Yeah, it's, it's moist. And now we've said it three times and we should probably right. cool our jets right there. Yeah, after that, it's like, you know, you can say the F word once in a movie and it's PG-13. But if it's more than once for whatever reason, it has to be R-rated. I don't know why they made this rule, but uh, I think, yeah, we're we're right on the bleeding edge of getting like an unclean rating on the podcasting authorities of the world. So let's, I'll, I'll watch my mouth. All right. So keeping that word at bay, you did mention creative juices oh, yeah. flowing. Uh, so today you wanted to talk about, and this is into, because I have no idea where you're going to go with this. No idea. Um, using original strength and the misconceptions behind using original strength. Am I, is that right? Very correct. Yeah. I, um, recently I was invited to, uh, take part in not take part, but be like kind of the, um, the expert in residence at a, um, at like a private forum, a training related forum for people who are interested. I mean, to some degree, there's there's uh, like an element of like the strong first crowd in there, as well as other elements. So serious trainees, you know, people who who take their training, uh, they take the training seriously. They they want to be focused. They want to be effective, and in many cases, they've got a lot of mileage on them. And uh, you know, unlike Superman, they can't just shake it off and be like, or Ethan Hunt, or you know, any of the other people that we love watching on on you know on the big screen, uh, and you know, they all, what was very cool is they all instinctively understood the value of original strength. And I think the majority of the questions that I got from them in some degree or another pertained to using original strength to help them get better at the, uh, uh, at their training, at their goals and, and what have you. Um, and there were a couple of things that people said and nothing was insulting by any means. It was just, you know, they didn't know. And it made me realize given the fact that I use OS every day, teach it in some capacity every day, whether it's in, you know, uh, info product that I'm, you know, selling or, or creating, whether it's in a one-on-one session with somebody online or something to that, uh, to that effect. There are just a lot of things that people don't really understand about OS. Like they, they understand like the sliver of it. It's like, you know, you see an iceberg in the water and it looks like just like a big a little chunk of ice. They don't see all of that, like that 95% underneath the surface. And um, most of them are content with being on on the surface of the water. And so they're not even aware that there's any benefit to going any deeper. So, uh, you know, as best I could while typing, uh, I did my best to, you know, kind of get them a better understanding of what original strength is all about, what it can be used for, how you can really dive very deep with it and still do all that in conjunction with your regular training without, you know, putting it to the side. Because I think that's one thing a lot of people fear it's like, oh, well, if I do this, I'm going to have to put you know, my other stuff to the side. Maybe I'm not going to be able to train this for a while. And it doesn't have to be like that. So that's kind of the background of all of this. And because I got a chance to uh, talk with people who are not you know, in my, my world uh, where I talk about OS all the time, and you know, the people who follow me, I think for the most part, are pretty, pretty uh, on top of things in terms of how to use it and what the benefits are. Um, these were people who were familiar with it, uh, knew a little bit and played with it, appreciated the system, but really know very little outside of just like what they may have seen in a few videos or, or things like that. And so I thought it would be great if we could uh, dispel some of those uh, misconceptions, uh, misapprehensions, and misunderstandings in this one podcast. Sounds awesome. So it, what, like, what was a typical question that you might have, or was it even a question or just like a notion? That you might have seen. Well, you know, one, 
that I thought was very good. It was one of the admins on the page. He asked, and I'll see if I can pull up his exact question. It may take me a while to find it because it was quite a long thread, but he said, I know that dead bugs aren't really considered uh, an original strength reset exactly, but how do you see that they fit into the, you know, into the world of original strength? And you know, I, I think I might know why he thinks that because you know, when if you know enough about original strength, you'll know that it is it is a system that's designed around the principles of the human developmental sequence. So, you know, obviously babies are not like, okay, at this point I now need to do dead bugs to get, you know, the front side of my X deflection portion of it working. Then I'm going to work on bird dog. But these are movements that still honor the principles of original strength even if they don't necessarily 100% look like something that you would see in the human developmental sequence. And I think one of the things you see a lot, and this is probably the case for, for I would bet any, any system of training or movement, is that um, I think people have a tendency to get latched on to the thing that they most readily see, maybe a tactic, you know, like um, for instance, in the kettlebell world, I know back in the good old days where kettlebells were not, we're not yet like in every single gym and whatever. It was still kind of a niche thing. My coach, Scott, and I uh, got a request to go do a kettlebell workshop for like a local body transformation gym. It's kind of like a, a chain of them. And one of the things they wanted to do on one of the days was kettlebell training. Well, this right off the bat, you should say, is kind of a red flag because they only want to do it on one day. So it seems like it's maybe more, more focused on being a, like a gimmick or, you know, something that they can use to just like sucker punch people. And Scott was the guy who they was their main point man. Um, but he said, yeah, they said that they want to learn clean and jerks and snatches. That's the main reason they want us to go there. And so obviously, you know, Scott had to explain, well, we'd love to teach you the clean and jerk and the snatch. Let's take a look at some of the fundamentals and make sure that you're ready for it so that you're not hurting yourself. Uh, but it's the same thing with OS. I think people see crawling, you know, and they see some of the other Cool stuff that we do and they're like okay you know you crawl around on the ground and you know these other things so uh i can see that as being part of the developmental sequence uh but then they're just kind of focusing on one specific element or i wouldn't call crawling a tactic per se but let's say um they're just looking at one part of it and then things that might make up other parts of the system uh or things that might actually function as resets like walking they don't see that as a reset, they just see that as something completely outside of the system. So to them, it oftentimes gets broken down into just uh, you know breathing, head control, rolling, rocking, and crawling. And they're like, that's original strength. And the reality is those are some of the tools that we use within original strength. So what I explained to them is actually dead bugs are a great reset because they can help you to train your gait pattern and they can really help you in particular to focus on the flexion side of things, like what's happening on the front side of your body or your anterior chain. If we want to sound, you know, super smart or what have you, uh, and bird dogs likewise, they don't originate. They don't originate with original strength, but they are still uh, a useful tool within it. Even if they're not, you know, again, you don't necessarily see babies specifically doing like, okay, I'm going to alternate, you know, you know, bird dogs one side to the other. They don't. They don't move like that. But you can see elements of it within it that uh, that are complementary to what's going on within. The, the human developmental sequence. So the big thing I think for, that people need to understand first, and that's a common misconception, is that uh, original strength is a series of principles and pillars that allow you then to choose and select what's best for you in terms of like the tactics or the exact uh, baseline movements, progressions or regressions that end up proving themselves to work best for you. So when you look at it like that, you can see similarities with, let's say, barbell training where, you know, okay, this is too heavy. I'm going to drop down some weight. Likewise, you can try an original strength reset, test it against something else and say, okay, I just feel way worse doing this or feel the same. Let me try something a little bit easier to meet me at the speed of my nervous system's adaptation. And oh, all of a sudden, you know, this feels better. I can move a little better, I've got better range of motion. This feels easier. Again, likewise with barbell training, you might find I'm um, trying to lift 315 off the ground Maybe it's not going up today. I'll drop it down to, let's say, 285. And then that feels good. And then you can continue to train like that. Maybe next time you go in, 315 goes up, just as an example. So this was one of the big things, I think, is um, 
we might say it's kind of like getting lost in the forest and not being able to see all the trees uh, in a manner of speaking, because uh, overly being overly focused on uh, whether or not babies are like, again, like I kind of joked earlier, time to roll on my back and do dead bugs so that I can get ready to roll over on all fours and then do bird dogs. The how something looks doesn't necessarily indicate uh, how it's uh, how it uh, affects your your training or your body. So that was a big one is explaining that actually we would consider a dead bug and and bird dogs a reset. Whether or not that the right one for you depends on you know you know if you test it out and it proves that it actually works very well. But um, it was the first time I'd ever heard that because I had I had always kind of thought that people who were doing OS or who knew anything about it would see the dead bug as being just, you know, uh, a regression of crawling, which is what we would, uh, how we would classify. It. So that was a big one. So part of, well, I am sure that I am probably the source of a great deal of misconceptions about, about OS. Like for, like I was just doing the math while you were talking and like, so, you know, you're talking about the tip of the iceberg and then what's underneath the water. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been, in OS so long, I'm really, I, I'm diving down to the depths, like to see how deep it goes. Right. So in the last nine years for 52, 52 weeks out of a year for nine years, I've put a video out about an OS reset mm -hmm. every week. And that's like what, 468 videos. And it's, wow. well, that's 468, which is 463 more videos than five resets, you, you know, and I can't, I, I, I don't necessarily do a great job of saying, Hey, this is why you want to do this. I just say, Hey, do this and see what, how it feels, see what, if you like it or not for the most part. Mm -hmm. But I mean, so at best I've probably created a lot of, well, these, these might make a good movement prep or warm up before you train or, or, you know, make you feel good before you get to bed. I don't know. So, you know, but I also think that there's like, I, I, I think of where I heard this recently that like there's never things are never like this is going to be better or worse it's that there are going to be trade-offs so you know for example if you say all right this time in my training uh, I'm not going to do kettlebell swings I'm going to do kettlebell snatches you know for the crowd listening who uh, for whom that would be a, a consideration well it doesn't make snatches better than swings, it doesn't, I mean, it might work better for your particular goal. Like if you wanna prepare for the snatch test, which is a hundred uh, snatches in five minutes with a given size weight, uh, then that's probably gonna be the right choice. But the trade-off is that maybe you're gonna to have to use lighter bells. Um, you're not gonna be able to do uh, swings. You might even have to leave out other movements that you would otherwise like to do because you're just not gonna have the time and the energy to do them. So uh, it's just a matter of, of trade-offs. And I think that, because I actually ran into a similar problem that you had a number of years ago when I was teaching like a women's fitness group when I lived in Israel, um, I would always try to find like a, a way, this is how I envision it in my head, is that I was taking you know a pattern rather than having them do the exact same thing all the time, I would show them, hey, here's a way that you can make it a little more challenging. You like maybe um, you, you go even slower or maybe you do kind of like, instead of rocking back and forth, maybe you do it like in a circle or you know, this sort of a thing, that sort of a thing. And uh, not realizing that they weren't viewing it as like, okay, I can take this move and compartmentalize it into this you know, container. It, you know, this is a container of this kind of, of like rocking or crawling variation. They saw them all as each different like exercises because that's just the way that their minds work. And I met them where they were, meaning like I did things that were at their ability level. But yeah, when I was, um, uh, when I was teaching them, it was like the last session I did with them. They were like, how are we going to remember all these moves? And again, this was last session before I was going to move back to the U.S. So I was like, oh, great. You know, like I spent all these years working with them and like I somehow just never uh, uh, clarified exactly like what my point was. I thought I thought I was being very clear enough. And I just explained to them very quickly. I said, well, I want you to see all these things. Like if you see a rocking variation, it doesn't mean you necessarily have to do that, but it's an option for you. The main thing to keep in mind is that with the original strength resets that we're doing, they're going to fit into one of these very broad categories. So like the deep breathing, whether you do it on your stomach or on your back, you're still breathing. You know, it, that's still the focus of the movement. Uh, neck nods, whether it's up and down or over your shoulders, 
it's it's just uh, it's head control essentially, and how it feels to you. If it doesn't feel very good, you just avoid it. If it feels really good, you do more of it. And uh, I think by the end they understood. Okay, so this isn't like hundreds of different things that he's given us. This is like five things uh, done with enough variety that on days where we don't really want to train or we just feel kind of this mental staleness, we can always do kind of one of these fun varieties that got tossed out. So whenever I see your videos, that's how I see it too. I see it like, oh, this is a great uh, variation on the bird dog. This is a great variation on you know rolling or, or things like that. But I think it's also important to have that novelty because for a lot of people, nobody wants to admit this. Trainers don't want to admit this uh, at the very least, but people kind of like to be entertained when they're working on it. Uh, they like to feel like there's some sort of novelty. And obviously you can't give them something new every single time because eventually they're just, they're not going to make any real progress. They're just kind of bouncing around all over the place. But it helps to inject a little bit of novelty into their training. And OS is good for that because with a, a, a mild change of how you do things, it can be a lot more exciting, a lot more interesting and really keep them engaged. And I think that the people who end up you know, signing up for the email list I think people who uh, go to the uh, the live events or the online events, they'll better understand, okay, this is a part of a system. All these things fit into these different, we'll say general interconnected columns, but they're not, I'm not looking at like 500 different exercises. I'm looking at five different things. And then I have uh, based off of the principles of uh, using a base, finding like a baseline for a movement, and then progressions and regressions, and then let's say more generically variations, these things, I can kind of figure out like where I need to be on this continuum. And so it ends up organizing it a lot more easily for them. But if they're only, yeah, if they're, all they're doing is watching YouTube videos, um, can't really blame them for not knowing anymore, but we can blame them for not having taken action, you know, to get on the email list, buying a book, you know, following a program, because that's where the real benefits are going to be. That's where they're going to start to dig a little bit deeper. And each touch point is only going to take them so deep, depends on, on what it is. If it's a course, that'll take them very deep. If it's the book, that's going to go beneath the surface enough for them to understand that there's a lot more down there. Um, but uh, yeah, I think you really can't be blamed for it either because you know, you've done it for so long. After a while, it just like consumes you and it's hard to keep in mind that there are, even if you think that you can very eloquently describe something, yeah, you have to be able to put yourself into the mind of the person who's got only a little bit of contact or no contact with it. I think it's almost easier in some cases to deal with somebody who's never heard of it before because you could shape their their view of OS like 100% just by, you know, in a, in a very short amount of time. But if you've got to like take somebody who's already used it on their own for a long time and then come up with certain conclusions about it, like, you know, oh, well, you know, these are the only rolling variations out there because this is what I saw in the book, as an example. Uh, I think in some ways that's almost a little bit tougher to be like, no, 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 there's a whole lot more. You know, you gotta, we gotta get you off of this path and just make a, a quick sideline to this one so that you can keep going in the direction you need to, but get there a lot faster. So that was, that was one of the things that I saw in the thread is that it was people who had great reverence for original strength and for what it had done for them but they got to sort of like the end of the path based off of the one that they started with. And they just don't even know how to move over to the next one to keep going to where they wanted to go. And um, yeah, so I, I wouldn't say I blame you entirely. That's the long and short of this response, I would say. Did you, I'm just curious, did you get anybody that asked or thought that maybe it was just only like for, I don't know, pain management or anything like that? I think there were people who thought it was like primarily for a warm up, or it, this was another one that I saw. Um, and I, I, maybe it's a bit of like a, a double edged sword, this one, but um, they, saw, they saw it as more like uh, a system based not around programming, but around like play. So they're like, yeah, just play with it and see what works. You know, and I think for some people that can be, um, that can be overwhelming because they're like, well, gosh, there are so many variations, you know, like, how do I narrow it down to just the stuff that, that helps me? And uh, that was a big one. I, I think there were probably some people in there who, I think there were definitely people, not I think there were definitely people, there were definitely people who saw it primarily as a, an approach to warming up, you know, like, oh, you do it, you know, a little bit before your training. And then as it was kind of like just the set warm up routine in perpetuity, like it didn't need to change. 
or adapt or grow or become an integral part of their training, such as let's say uh, crawling for distance or for time or trying to accumulate a certain amount as a means of gaining more strength and resilience and stamina and things like that. So that's those are a couple of things that I saw for sure was uh, uh, those two things. Pain management, I don't think I saw that as much, but I have no doubt there are plenty of people who see it primarily as that. Yeah, I was just wondering because like some people will say, well, OS doesn't re didn't really work for me. My knee still hurt or or on the other side, well, it's, it's a it's a mobility system. But I mean, to me, well, yeah, it greatly helps with mobility, but that's just the beginning also. Yeah. And really, I mean, that, that just lead, lends itself to like performance, to strength, to whatever. Yeah, because that's what mo mobility really is. It's the it ability is. to move a joint through its range of motion using strength. So saying it's like just a mobility system is, uh, uh, well, I mean, it's obviously not the whole picture, but it's also definitely not a knock against the system per se. Right. It just shows that you're like, okay, well, you've, you've probably never done uh, like crawling for or trying to crawl for 10 minutes. You know, you do that you know, for a couple of weeks and then you test out, let's say, you know, your front squat or your military press or you know, how many push-ups you can do. And suddenly you're going to find that it has nothing to do with your mobility. Your performance is a lot better. Because you put on some very some very real strength, really knitted your body together the way that you're supposed to. Suddenly, again, and you do have better mobility, but you've also got the performance as well. Whereas you can do some mobility exercises, and you know it's kind of just like unlocking a little bit of extra range of motion, but your performance may not go through the roof. It's very different with OS, and a lot of people I don't think have ever done, let's say, crawling for a long period of time, or rolling for five minutes in a row, or you know, loaded anything. So they have kind of like a limited amount of understanding of just how many things that you can do and how many of them are actually extremely productive. Speaking of, this is, this is a tangent, but crawling for time and stuff. Did, have you seen those recent videos of the people in China, like marching while they crawl? Like the, they call it the, I don't know, dragon crawl or something. W weren't they... I didn't see the marching while they crawled. It wasn't marching. I call it marching because they were all in sync when they crawl, oh, they step, yeah. and they... And they're doing they, like, like, it's like Spider-Man push-ups kind of like. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. The only thing I'm curious about though, I mean, it looks, I mean, it, it looks crazy amazing, but you know, you only see the clips for like three seconds at a time. And I'm wondering, well, how long did they do that? <laughs> Let's take five paces uh, while the camera's rolling. While the camera's rolling. Exactly. I wanted the same thing too. Now, if they did that for like 10 minutes. Then that's, yeah. wow. <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty incredible. But yeah, I get, the, I get the same sense that you see it and you're like, well, they're on a really long road. Ipso facto, they must have done it the whole way. Where in reality, it's like, okay, everybody down, camera's rolling, you know, let's do it. Okay, take two, take three. You know, you never know how many like of these short takes they're doing. But yeah, I did see that. I'm impressed because they, they all seem to move really well. You they know, did like, and in and unison it, and with good quality it was perfect like the, everybody was definitely in sync and together i mean it was yeah. perfect i did see that and then i i sent you guys something on the the os instagram page of a basketball player crawling and doing some other os resets and i thought that was super cool one of my um uh one of my online students and regular followers sent it to me I, i'm not a basketball fan but he is so he he was like, it looks like this guy's, you know, got some good coaches or something like that. And I was like, this is amazing. I got to so, send this to OS. Two things stood out to me about that basketball video. One was he was doing it on the court. And obviously it was like, looked like they were, I mean, he was in uniform, like they were going to get ready to play a game. The other thing that really stood out to me, though, he was doing it barefoot without his socks and shoes on. Oh, I didn't notice that. Yeah. And I was like, well, how about that? I like, he, his he took his shoes off to do that. It's amazing. Yeah, it's uh, it's good to see this stuff too, you know, because I know that uh, this OS instructor Chip Morton has trained a lot of athletes, and a lot of that's behind the scenes, so you don't necessarily see videos of it, and not just you know athletes. He was the, what the Cincinnati Bengals mm -hmm. SNC coach for the longest time, and so we're talking like pro athletes who are getting exposed to OS, and uh, it's good to see that whether it's through OS or some other you know trainer or system or whatever, seeing that people are starting to get back in touch with being barefoot you know, crawling on the ground, just doing these basic movements instead of stuff that we're used to seeing, like LeBron James bouncing around doing God knows what on like, a, you know, BOSU ball. Whatever. And I can't talk trash because I think he's successful because he's truly a phenom and he's done 
Uh, he's done extremely well for himself, but there are times that I've heard it said that af- many athletes succeed in spite of themselves and not because of their training. And uh, mm-hmm. I don't know who his coach was. I don't know what the coach was thinking, but sometimes I see stuff like that. I'm like, I don't know that that's actually really going to do all that much except for get him to write you a check because it's something he's never done or tried before. But uh, I would love to see more people like this gentleman, you know, crawling on the court, uh, going barefoot, that sort of a thing. That'd be, uh, that'd be huge. Yeah, I think it's neat. Um, so back to, back to your uh, forum yeah. where you were and you were talking about, and this is a, and this may be a weird question because um, you're talking That's about, right you were talking about finding misconceptions about OS, but did you find any, did, do people have misconceptions about strength inside the forum? Oh yeah. Actually, I think I see more strength misconception. I don't know if it was in the forum in particular. Um, I don't even know if I would call it misconceptions other than maybe like misapprehensions, because one of the things that I, I try like mad to get people to understand is and this is one of the things I think is great about OS is that you see that there's a lot of variety and it's like you're given tacit approval to try things out. You know, it's not like again some coaches or some systems are very much like if you're not doing this exercise, you know, if you're not using this implement, you're wasting your time. It's stupid, what have you. Um, but a lot of people I think get a little bit overly focused on like minimalism and. There's nothing wrong with minimalism other than the fact that there's not like a like a, a standard, like agreed upon definition of it. Like j- just to give you an example, um, I I had uh, Jeff Newport. I think you've heard of him before. Yeah, yeah I think that sounds familiar. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. Think about it a little. I think I'm sure. So. Yeah, Maybe. I think it'll come to, to mind. Uh, he's got a definition that I think works well. My friend Pat, Flynn, our friend Pat Flynn, who you know him as well. Um, he's also got a very good definition. Uh, of minimalism. And so if they have successful approaches with it. A lot of other people I asked on a, on a completely different forum um, earlier this year, how do you define minimalism? And I honestly don't think, there were like 50 responses. I honestly don't think any of them were identical. Um, so a lot of times what it is, is it's just like people are like, oh, I just decided I'm going to do, see how few exercises I can get away with doing. And then I'm going to do them in perpetuity. And then in a couple of months, I'm going to ask why this hurts or why that hurts or why I've stalled out, why I can't get any more, any more uh, improvements. And so um, one of the things that I think is detrimental about that, if it works for you, there's no problem, obviously, but I, everything has a shelf life uh, is kind of like this. Uh, so what I'm about to say is not specific to this forum. Actually, this is just speci- this is just really more the people that I interact with on a daily basis. Um, again, a small amount within this particular forum, but a large amount everywhere else uh, is the idea that, you know, you've always got to be doing these certain basic kettlebell and bodyweight movements. So you've always got to do uh, this movement pattern, this variation, you know, this many sets and reps. Um, and almost invariably, uh, people will end up with some sort of like a joint issue or at, at worst, you know, or at best, it's like I just haven't been able to make any, you know, any improvements or other like I've gotten really good at this one thing, but other things have have started to decline. And um, yeah, I see it all over the place. It wasn't I wasn't particular to this forum because they they seem to understand the value of strength. And so for them, it was more like, how do I maximize my strength and my conditioning and less, you know, like, how do I. Uh, um I don't know. How do I get away with still doing so little and continue to make goals? Like they they are they were more interested in actually moving ahead than just being like hyper focused on only doing certain moves. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah, I, I see it a, a huge amount where uh people will just completely write off entire exercises or you know movements or set and rep schemes because realistically it's because nobody like gave them permission to use them. In reality, they don't need to ask permission. They should just try the stuff out and see if it works. Um, that's a big part. A lot of people just find something that they really like doing, and then they fear that if they ever move away from it, not only are they going to lose all those gains, but everything that they tried out is going to prove to have been an abysmal failure, and everyone will laugh at them, and you know, whatever. And it doesn't. It just doesn't happen like that. I get this question a lot, so I'll throw it at you just to. Let listeners hear what you have to say about it, because it could be neat. 
how do you know if um, or when you're strong enough? You have to define it. What is strong enough? Like, you know, that's the thing that the, the person asking has to know. Like, how do you know? You'll know. I, for instance, um, if you're getting to the point where you have to like rearrange your schedule just because your workouts are getting so long or I don't know, um, well, you don't feel, I think another one probably would be like, you don't feel inspired to keep doing the same thing. You've probably gone far enough, at least for now with what you're working on, you know, like, um, and most people I also think are not, are not really, this is not a knock against them. They're not like that ambitious. So they might say something like, uh, you know, I want to do 20 pull-ups. It's like, everybody wants to do 20 pull-ups. Do you want to do the preparation necessary to get you the 20 pull-ups? And so maybe they find out, they get to 10. You're like, you know what? I'm pretty happy with this. I, I feel like I look pretty good. And, you know, uh, I feel good. My joints feel fine. Um, you know, people are commenting that I, I look like I've been working out more. The reality is, is that even though we often use strength or, or we'll say strength specifically in this case, as a, a cornerstone of our training, most people, I think, want to get strong for a reason. They want to get strong because they, they want to look and feel better. They want to have the confidence that they had when they were younger and they, you know, they could afford to spend two hours a day training at the college gym or something like that. Uh, they want to be able to keep up with their kids and grandkids. I don't really think, for instance, that like 20 pull-ups over 10 is going to help you play with your kids, uh, you know, uh, let's say backyard football or pick up basketball. It's probably not going to help you all that much more. So you just have to decide, do I want to have to, like, do I want my training to take me down this road, which may not actually give me the stuff that I was actually kind of working out for to begin with? Um, am I now doing it for the sake of doing it? There's nothing wrong with that. But you have to understand uh, that that's the question you're going to have to ask. You'll get to a point where you'll be pretty happy. And maybe you just, you know, after that, you want to move on to do other things. You know, maybe you want to focus on a uh, different kind of training. Maybe you want to take up a different physical hobby. And uh, you might not need extra strength for it. You might have all you need. And then what you really want to do is get good at, say, martial arts or, uh, I don't know, like rock climbing or something like that. Uh, yeah, I, I think that there is a point at which just adding more strength is just more because the amount of work that's going to go into, let's say, adding reps to a given exercise or adding weight uh, is going to detract from other things, whether that's roughhousing with your kids, uh, you know, hiking on the weekends with your friends, stuff like that. I think at that point, you'll know you're strong enough for, for what you want to accomplish. Right on. You, you yourself use different tools. Um, anybody that that trains with you or follows you knows that you use different tools. How do you find balance in that? Um, well, the first thing again is figuring out what it is that you want to do, uh, what it is you want to achieve, where you're lacking, like where you're frustrated. So one of the things that I've never really spent much time actually working up to it. Cause I, I knew I would just have to do a lot of, a lot of work. And I just, at the time it didn't really appeal to me to do it. And thankfully it didn't, but like one arm chin ups. I'd love to be able to do them one day. I will do them one day. Uh, and so right now I'm in kind of like a long road to building up to them. So I'm doing a bit more body weight work in order to, uh, in order to work up to it. But I also want to be strong in general. So I don't want to end up doing something where I'm, I'm like, let's say, I don't know, doing several hundred pull-ups a week and neglecting, you know, my legs, my midsection, not doing my resets, other stuff like that. I haven't gotten to the point where that's actually going to boost me over to the point where I'll actually be able to do the one arm chin up. So right now it's just not, you know, not something to worry about. So for instance, it is hard to figure out what it is that you want to do and how you're going to make the time to do it. As I discussed earlier, you know, I'm breaking my workout up into sections so that I can get it, uh, get it finished or get all the workload finished um, in the, in the short amounts of time that I have. So for instance, right now I'm, I'm kind of uh, going back to my roots and doing more kettlebell and calisthenics and, and movement training. Whereas for some time, I uh, I made a, a bit of barbell training more of my focus because I did one of Dan John's mass building programs earlier this year. And you got kind of beefy. I got very beefy. Actually, this might blow your mind because you've, you've met me in person a number of times. And I think last time we saw each other was in 
2019. And I found an old photo of that. For whatever reason, we weighed ourselves and we just compared notes. And I remember, I think you were like 155. And I was like, it seems like you should weigh more than that because he's just like really muscular, but okay. Um, and then I weighed like 172. And you were like, oh my gosh, you don't look like you should weigh 172. So from that, we both we both figured that, you know, we're not, we would not do well at a carnival guessing game. Like guess, you know, so-and-so's weight. Um, but yeah, that the peak of this program, I got up to 192 pounds. Wow. Which is holy crow. Batman. I know. It was um <laughs> this was I say peak for a very good reason because it was just like after I think probably my second peanut butter and jelly sandwich of the day, I went and I weighed myself at the gym and I was like, 192, my God. You know, like I better get my blood pressure checked at this point because I I feel like so, the amount of I put on like I think 10 or 12 pounds over the course of this program. You were full in then. You you even did the Dan John peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Three to four a day. It was, by the way, I have to say this, Dan, if you're listening, that was uh, far and away the best tip in the book. The tip was, uh, the book is mass made simple, but, and it's full of really great uh, tips. But there was a period of time during Passover where you're not, you're not supposed to eat leavened bread. It's part of the, uh, it's part of the celebration, or, you know, part of the observance of the holiday. And you can eat like matzah, which is like this sort of dry, unleavened bread. It's like a cracker, but with even less taste. <laughs> and um, so rather than eating like peanut butter and matzah sandwiches, which I just couldn't like, bear the thought of, you know, uh, I just didn't didn't eat uh, didn't eat anything. I mean, I still ate multiple meals a day and I was following everything else that he said. But for that eight days, my weight plateaued. And it wasn't until I started eating the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches again that I would go in. I would see another pound here, another one there. Um, it made a huge difference. It, I was stunned. It didn't matter how much protein I ate. Like didn't change the scale much peanut butter and jelly sandwiches were like yeah you packed it on like you wouldn't believe the magic of peanut butter man every time every time never would have guessed i never would have guessed but uh but yeah so point being is like now i've uh after that program i continue to do a little bit of barbell work a few times in the gym and then i would do you know stuff at my place uh the other days of the week and then i finally was like you know i just don't really like I'm just not like, having fun with it anymore. It's still a perfectly fine modality. It's just, I feel like I've kind of uh, just run out of wind with it for now. So maybe I'll come back to it later. So now I'm back to doing like some of the classic uh, calisthenic stuff. Um, and on in between days, I'm making sure that I get in like some, we'll say some ultra loaded resets. So I'm doing farmer's carries while also dragging a bunch of weight behind me through a field uh, near my fortress of swolitude. So this, uh, if it were up to me, I would also add like crawling and just have a minimal amount of time. So I'm like, I haven't done a lot of the like the loaded uh, upright resets. So like loaded carries and dragging and, and what have you. So I'll focus on that and then keep crawling at kind of a maintenance level. And then at some point or another, I'll ramp it up. But that's how you just have to figure out like in particular, again, referring to Dan John, what are, as Dan says, like the standards you want to reach and i want to improve my my weighted pull up is one of the things i want to do as well as my um, wall or uh, chest to wall handstand push ups those are the two big ones for the upper body um and then uh what are the gaps you need to fill and one thing i just have not done a lot of is like loaded uh reset work and particularly um anything like dragging i i would kind of go in, in fits and starts with it and i want to be a little bit more consistent so in finding that balance and fitting everything to your goals and the time frames that you have um, so that you don't lose your sanity, you're also okay with letting a season run its course. Mm -hmm. Like once the barbell had run its course, you were okay exploring something else as well. Yeah, definitely. That's the other thing I think people have a hard time with is that they think, okay, if I stop this now, I'm going to lose all my gains. And uh, you know, I always tell people, you will definitely go backward because that's just you can't you can't walk towards something else without walking away from from something but if you know the path back it's going to be a lot quicker to regain it once you go back to it and what a lot of people end up finding is once they start uh, filling in their gaps in their training you know they go back to the stuff that they were doing before and all of a sudden it's there you know it's like for instance for me i didn't really need to train for it and i can still i could still do a weighted pull up with an extra 32 kilos or 70 pounds, even at a heavier body weight. Because when I first achieved it, I was like, 
I think maybe 160 pounds. And now I'm like, I haven't weighed myself recently, but let's say 181, 185, something like that. Still beefy. Still beefy. Absolutely. Beefier even, you know, than I was back in the 160 days. Not 192 beefy, but it wasn't all beef. You know, some of it was the marbling, let's say. Um, but uh, but yeah, nevertheless, I, I could still I could still do that. So I maintained uh, maintained that ability and realistically grew it because now I have more body weight. So I'm actually pulling up even more weight than I would mm-hmm. have before. But in order to get up to, you know, next big one I would like to do is um, do my previous max of an added 97 pounds but at a heavier body weight, meaning it'll be more weight pulled up overall, uh, and then 106 pounds. And I'm just using the, the standard jumps in the kettlebell uh, weight for my uh, for what I'm focusing on in particular. And then with like uh, wall handstand push-ups, for instance, um, I know that if I get much better at those, military press will be there. So I don't I don't have to worry so much about doing that. It would be kind of redundant. Um, and then for the legs, you know, I'm still doing like squatting and hinging movements so at least the skill in that movement pattern will still be there but yeah i'm changing and focusing on a a different um a different modality and i understand that if i want to peak with something else at some point like the kettlebell i'll have to put aside probably the handstand push-ups and i'll have to do some specific work for the kettlebell but the strength to do it will be there so it'll be a much shorter path than it would have been you know starting out not having done the, the stuff that i'm doing now Awesome. So one, I'd, I'd like to ask you this too, just for fun. Um, and if you need me to edit this out, I'll edit it out. Uh, no editing. Somebody told me that you were working on a project with John Brookfield. Oh, yes, absolutely. In fact, um, I have to text John back. He texted me yesterday in the middle of my workout and I was doing the carries like across this field. Yeah, with as many kettlebells as I could load up, you know, and so I was just like huffing and puffing. I was like, I'll text him back. Yeah, it's and hard I to just, text while you're doing carries. It's 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 exactly. very hard. It's hard to do just about anything. Breathing actually is also becomes you know marginally challenging. Uh, but yeah, uh, he and I are working on a project. We already have a name picked out. We have a theme picked out. I'm not going to give away too much information. But for those who are not familiar with John Brookfield, uh, you are missing out. Actually, you are probably familiar with him because. If you've ever seen anybody doing that crazy battling rope stuff, you you owe that to John because he pretty much invented it, as far as I recall. Um, yep. He is a visionary. He is a brilliant, brilliant dude. And uh, so I'm very excited to be working with him on this, this uh, project. And we're going to be doing something that is going to probably knock your socks off. Um, I would say maybe other articles of clothing. I don't know. Socks are going to be a bare minimum, <laughs> for sure. It's a family uh, show. But... <laughs> Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, you know, as soon as we get it like all finished, I'm going to be coming out, as you probably know, coming out to uh, Fukui Varina. I want to make sure I pronounced it correctly for the sensors. That was pretty close. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how Fukui is it? Yes, Fukui. Oh, Fukui. Ah, okay, okay. Um, in late November. And so we are going to do some filming for this course that we're putting out. And it is going to be the bomb.com. You folks are going to love it. And uh, some of the stuff that he's he's told me so far, we still have to compare some extra notes. Uh, I really think it's going to be, I think it's already revolutionary, but I think it's really going to revolutionize a lot of people's strength, their stamina, their overall fitness, and it'll change their opinions of how strong and fit they can get with very, very little equipment. So be on the lookout because that's coming soon. 2023 sounds like it could be an exciting year. It's it certainly shall be, absolutely, and uh, yeah, it's going to be big. So very, and I'm also looking forward to meeting John in person because he and I have chatted on the phone multiple times. We've done a couple of Zoom calls, and uh, he's he's always brimming with great ideas. You know, and he's even in his 60s, he's still making gains in his training, whereas a lot of people have decided oh, I'm going to take up golf or knitting or some I don't know something lame. You know, he's out there crushing it and defying gravity, even after all these years. So yeah, it's going to be awesome. He is uh, an impressive specimen uh, for sure. <laughs> good word for it. Specimen is a very good word for it. So um, do you have anything else new coming out of the pipe for yourself? Yeah, later this month, um, for the people on my email list, I'm going to be putting out a new challenge called Backtober. It's going to be all about 
train on your back to make it huge and more, you know, well, huge, strong, uh, capable, all these other good things. And uh, of course, you know, I couldn't resist the opportunity to use a pun. So backtober it is. I like it. Uh, I or like play, it. play on words, we'll say in this case. Um, what else? Uh, I've got, I happen to have one nearby, but there's also my book that if you want to go on Amazon and get it, you can get your own copy. The No BS Kettlebell and Bodyweight Kickstart Program ended up at number one uh, the day it was released. I don't that know is awesome. That is awesome. Men's health too. So it was not some like obscure category like what people will do. It was actually men's health. It was, it was number one. So I was very excited about that. Um, and I have another book that I'm working on right now. And because this is a family show, it contains a naughty word that I can't, can't say what it's called. Uh, it's not like the F word, just so you know. But, <laughs> uh, but suffice it to say, I, I will send you the title later and you can, you can decide just how, how much of it you will <laughs> pronounce on air, let's say on a later date and time. But uh, so I've got that that I'm working on. And um, I'm sure, there are plenty of other things. I, of course, of course, with John, that's going to be very, very cool. Uh, and looking at, looking forward to gearing up, come out to Fuquay Arena. That was it. Carolina. Absolutely. In uh, the very near future. And uh, being able to hang out with you and Danny and the whole OS crew again. It's been three years. More it's than been a while. Now. This is the last time we've even seen each other. So um, that's going to be very big and exciting. And then last thing, this is not new, but um, if anybody likes original strength for strength training purposes, and not just for warm up. Obviously, warm up it will always be valuable for that. But you can get my nine minute kettlebell and body weight challenge for free at nine minute challenge dot com. And that's the number nine. Some people, for some reason, some people like to write out like N I N E. There's no need. Just put the number nine. Nine nine. nine minute <laughs> exactly. Nine <laughs> minute challenge dot com. Uh, if you're German, definitely know that it's the English number nine. Uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, but yeah, it focuses on uh, getting stronger using the gate pattern and doing movements that you can do in conjunction with your regular training. So I like to tell people it's kind of like adding like a turbo booster to your car. You don't have to get a whole new car. You just add the booster to it. And all of a sudden, you know, uh, car's performance is you know, it's faster. Uh, it attracts more women, all sorts of stuff like this. So nine minute challenge.com. It's free. That's the other important thing to mention. And uh, the level or degree to which it attracts women, I suppose, is uh, up to you to, to decide. But I can guarantee you, you will get stronger. We will put that in the notes, uh, the comment yeah. section of the show. Um, one last question for you, because I know yeah. everybody's going to be wondering since you brought it up. And I would, well, it would be me fumbling the football if I did not ask. You gained all this mass um, during the, with, with the, the Dan John uh, episode uh, with the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Yes. What brand of peanut butter were you using to gain all this mass? Not Jif, I'll tell you that much, <laughs> because right around this time, there was this huge <laughs> salmonella epidemic. That would have been the worst thing possible for my mass. You get like horribly <laughs> sick. You pro I probably would have gotten super lean. That I'm 140 been... pounds. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, sh I'm ripped to shreds. I'm, I'm just impromptu signed up for a bodybuilding competition. So I'll let you know. Um, I think I used Kirkland, which is like the Costco brand. Yep. Uh, I went out and bought some Kirkland peanut butter and I got no sugar jelly this was dan's recommendation i think but i also decided because i didn't want to end up with zits all over my face and i just have a tendency when i eat too much sugar uh to end up look it's like a fountain of youth for me actually sugar is and it's because i i get that youthful like zit filled appearance whenever i eat too much of it so hence the fountain of youth get it because when you're young yeah, i get it I, yep yeah, okay. yeah i got it. i just I got it. you weren't laughing and so i <laughs> i wanted to make sure but at any rate, uh, yeah, I got the, I got the sugar-free uh, jelly. And, uh, but I think it was Kirkland peanut butter. Uh, I like peanut butter of all kinds, except for the kind that gives you salmonella. So I avoided Jif. I understand. I was very sad that Jif was gone for months and months. But I'm, I, I'm, I've rejoiced several times now. I remember that, actually, because I remember you posted something on Facebook about how you were bummed out or something like that. The Jif had turned into, like, poison, you know, just right before our very eyes. So, but you've now also you've also brought it to my attention that I need to use my new Costco membership and try Kirkland's peanut butter just to see my, what it's about. So I can first of all, let me tell you something. The first time and I had been into Costco's before, like when I lived in Pennsylvania, um, I went somebody that I knew had one, so I would sometimes go with her and we would get you know 
get groceries. So it's not like I'd never been to one before, but I'd never been to the one in Omaha. And I'm sure it's similar to the, all the other ones, but I was just like amazed at like, I was like, my God, this is, this is like the crowning jewel of America, all this abundance, you know, like generations past would have killed for this. And uh, um, it's incredible. And their, their chicken, they have like full rotisserie chickens that are like twice the size of anything you're going to get anywhere else for like four ninety nine. It's like they're throwing it away and, and they're good. That's the other thing. It's not garbage. Um, yeah. By, by the way, total side note, I think one of my favorite stories about Costco is, you know, they have $1.50 hot dogs. I did not only know dollar fifty $1.50 everywhere. It's only $1.50. I think that was the original price that they charged for them. And the, the original CEO for Costco told, or one of the co-founders of Costco, told the new CEO, he said, if you change the price of the hot dogs, I'll kill you. <laughs> so they, <laughs> they kept the hot dogs the same. The CEO is still alive. Um, but yeah, Costco is great. I mean, they've got uh, a huge variety of things. And if you like peanut butter in abundance, there is no small jar of peanut butter. there. Everything is massive. So uh, yeah, you, you spend a reasonable amount of money. You get an unreasonable amount of food. It is, uh, we are truly blessed. I will tell you that much. And Costco is is exhibit a so and on that non-paid for <laughs> yeah costco really ought to be giving me a free <laughs> membership because i i bought the executive membership at the suggestion of the sales lady when i was there last year and uh yeah so costco if you want to cut me a check i will gladly accept it right on alex thanks man this has been a lot of fun likewise uh glad to reconnect i'm looking forward to seeing you next month yes sir Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Alex, the Hebrew hammer, Salkin. Adieu. Thanks for listening, everyone. Now get outside and play.